Good evening, everyone. It's, it's lovely to be back here again with you all. And for those of you who weren't here last week, um, I am Tina Rasmussen, and I've been a friend of Rick's for, more, I think, more than 15 years now. Um, we knew each other back in the day before he published Buddha's Brain, and I saw manuscripts of it, and he saw manu manuscripts of my book. and. Um, so he asked me to come and fill in for him for a few weeks and talk about the Samatha practice. So um, that is what I did last week. And I'm just going to put my um, website name in here. So, oops, I'm putting my hot link to, the, to this in here. Um, I'll just put my hot link in here so that if you want to know any more about any of this, you can. Um, you can find that. And that would include um, retreats, one-on-one um, -on -one sessions, um, interviews I've done on various podcasts, and uh, my newsletter. So um, it's lovely to be back here with you all. And last week, I did um, an overview of the Samatha practice, which I'll just condense into a short version. So anybody who wasn't here can um, understand a bit about the practice. And then we'll do a sitting for about 30 minutes. And then I'll talk, we'll take a break. And then I'll talk about the hindrances and um, how to work with uh, when we go off into thought and meditation, when we're you know, when we can't stay with the object of meditation, basically, is what the hindrances are in Buddhism. So, um, and I'm seeing notes here that people can't see me, but I'm not really sure what else to do. It's so funny yeah. because I can see myself just fine. Right. So if there's something, Tom, that you could do, that well, would be great. I, I, I think just move forward. I think okay. it's a, a bandwidth problem, uh, just internet uh, traffic or slow down so okay I mean, well, I can, I can hopefully, see move, hopefully i'm not making a weird face for those of you where no. i'm frozen if i am you can just get a good laugh out of that so um the samatha practice is the practice of concentration and serenity so this is a good time with all that's happening with the technology right now to feel into the possibility of some serenity. And why don't we actually just do it for a minute, just to kind of settle from the, you know, choppiness of the technology problems. So just in a nutshell, basically we're knowing we're breathing, we're breathing, which you're already doing anyway. And the breath is a very soothing um, thing to notice and be aware of because it's basically keeping us alive. So there's something soothing about that. Just notice your breath coming in and out. And just for right now, you don't need to be doing anything. Just sitting, knowing you're breathing. And so in a simple format, this is the Samatha practice, is breathing and knowing we're breathing. And in particular, it can be noticed in this place that is um, called the Anapana spot or region, Anapana meaning breath in Pali. And so this was a practice um, that the Buddha learned from his teachers and um, was actually predates the Buddha. I think it's been around for something like 5,000 years. And I always like to think that, you know, there aren't that many things in human history that have lasted that long. And why would that be? Well, because it works. That's why it's lasted that long, because it actually works. And um, so... I won't go into all of what I said last time, but this was a huge part of the Buddhist 
practice and life. And so seeing him as a role model and how important it was to him really inspired me to learn more about it and um, ultimately to end up teaching it. So some of the reasons to do the practice, it is specifically a um, serenity practice. So not only is it a concentration practice, but serenity. And it also purifies the mind stream. So when we're um, doing the practice, one of the things we notice is that as we try to be with the breath, there will be times when we're, we'll go off of the breath and be lost in thought or um, notice that we've just lost track of the object, which in this case is the breath. And part of what's happening there is that our, we're seeing our compulsive thought patterns. So the things that are pulling off, if it wasn't compulsive, then we would be able to just stay with the breath. So this is what's telling us that it's compulsive. And those thought patterns are running underneath our awareness all day long. It's just that when we meditate, we actually see it and we're noticing that that's what's happening. So just by in the simple act of coming back to the breath, we are deconditioning those patterns. We're kind of challenging the compulsiveness. And in a lot of ways, it's like going to the gym and lifting a weight where we're, you know, we might start out with a, say, we tried to lift a 10 pound weight and it felt kind of heavy. But if we keep doing those repetitions over and over, we get better and better at it. And at some point it feels light. And that's really what we're doing with the Samatha practice is we're challenging those patterns and um, learning to be able to direct our attention to something that neutral or positive, which the breath is, and not be lost in compulsive thought that isn't necessarily helping. Like one of the recent brain research studies showed that um, 80 to 90% of our thoughts are repetitive. And so they're the same thought patterns that we've been thinking a week ago and a month ago and a year ago and five years ago and 10 years ago. And we don't really need all of those thoughts in order to function in life. And a lot of those thoughts actually cause suffering. And you know, this is really sort of the core of Buddhism is that as long as we're identified with those and they're compulsive, we're going to suffer unnecessarily. So just a simple act of coming back to the breath over and over is kind of giving us a software upgrade to our consciousness where instead of running over these same neural pathways, which you know, the neuroscience has shown us that the more times we run over those same neural pathways, like say a person has a neural pathway of um, anxiety where they're worrying about the future and feeling like they have to, you know, constantly be like trying to plan and replan and plan better. And, you know, that is a neural pathway that's not necessarily going to help with the actual outcome. Or if somebody say beats themselves up a lot, um, these are all neural pathways that, you know, the Buddha talked about the second arrow. The first arrow is the difficulties and the pains we encounter in life. And the second arrow is the added suffering and ruminating that we put on top of that. And so the second arrow really is optional. And so this is what, yeah, somebody's saying defragging your hard drive. It is a little bit like that. Yeah. So we're just by coming back to the breath, we're learning how to turn away from thoughts that may be distressing, that may be causing us to suffer unnecessarily. And we're also culti cultivating that capacity to be, um, to be present in the present moment, using the breath as an anchor and to cultivate some serenity. Who couldn't use that? a little more serenity in this, you know, phase of the world that we're in. The other thing it does is build that muscle of concentration that the neuroscience books like, you know, The Shallows and others, you know, Rick probably talks about these things. Um, uh, 
we're losing the capacity to actually be able to concentrate and stay with something. And I've seen so many articles with headlines saying something like, I've lost the ability to read because we're, you know, just going from one thing to another and online searches and so on. This practice, because it's a concentration practice, it counteracts those, um, that patterning that's happening in our actual gray matter of our brains and um, giving us more of a capacity to concentrate. So in the traditional Theravadan Buddhist stages of practice, um, there's three, sila, samatha, and vipassana. Sila, which is S-I-L-A, is really about how we live our life off the cushion. Samatha is the concentration and serenity. And then vipassana, which many of you may know, is more like the mindfulness where we're being aware of a kind of the stream of whatever is most predominant in our consciousness um, without getting lost in thought. And each of these is cultivating important things that are really worth, um, worth being aware of. So in the Samatha practice, we are coming back to the breath basically. And if you want to do it in the more technical way that it's done, you would notice the breath in what is called the anapana spot or region. So this is the area between the upper lip and the nostril. And it could be a real specific spot or it could be a general area. Either of those is fine. Um, and if you want to do it more generally, you can notice the breath wherever it's predominant. That, that is okay too. But noticing in, in this smaller area, it will help our concentration to deepen more quickly because it's a little bit harder and it's a smaller, more um, sort of discrete area that, um, that is a little bit more concentrated. It's, it brings the mind stream together. That's really what concentration practices do is they unify the mind stream just like with the flashlight, if we go from the wide beam to the narrow beam, that's kind of like what is happening to our consciousness in this practice. And so we notice the breath to the exclusion of everything else. We don't need to be aversive to everything else. We don't need to push it away or think it's bad. It's not bad in any way. We need to be able to thank for our lives. But this is allowing us to. Um, to build the capacity to turn away from thoughts that may be stressful or you know, start thoughts that can lead to depression, anxiety, you know, um, all of these hindrances that really aren't adding to our life and are, are just causing us to, um, to suffer. So this is really what we're cultivating in this is that capacity. So we'll sit in just a minute, but are there any questions before we go to the sitting? And I think if you have one, you can just type it in. Okay, so we will, now we'll go ahead and do a sitting and um, and we'll sit for 30 minutes. And I won't, I know a lot of times um, there's a lot of verbal instructions, but the way I see it is that part of, if you're, we're using that analogy of, of lifting the weights at the gym, you need to be able to try lifting it on your own without the support of me talking the whole time. That will make you stronger than if I, you know, am doing constant guiding. So there will be times that, um, that I won't be speaking. And let's see, there is a question here and I'm gonna talk about counting in just a minute. Somebody was asking about that. Let me read this question. You really appreciated it. It's compelling and intense. Um, it might draw too much energy to the head. 
Yeah, so this is a practice where we're really orienting towards the mystery that is beyond the body and the personality. If you feel it's too much energy in the head, then you can do it in the belly. If that is a concern of yours, people have been doing this for 5,000 years. So there's, there's nothing about it that's harmful or dangerous or anything like that. But if that's a concern, you can, um, you can do it in the belly. That would be, um, let's see. So there's other questions about more about um, the Samatha practice more generally, and I'll answer those after we do the sitting. But for now, I think let's go ahead and do the sitting and anything that's really specifically related to doing the sitting, I'll address right now. So, the, so that brings me to the counting. And with the counting, the way that works is we count from one to eight and then back down from eight to one. And the way it works is you count, you breathe in, and out and then at the pause between the in breath and the out breath, then you just lightly put in the number one. So you're not saying one the whole time you're breathing in and out. It's not like one, you know, because then um, the breath can be become, the object can become the number. And then if you drop the number at some point, then you don't have the breath anymore. So this is why you, you go in and out and then just lightly do the one in, internally and then the next one two. And you go up to eight. And then when you get eight, you go back to one. And you might find at some point you're on 27. And if that happens, you know, don't beat yourself up. Just gently come back to the breath and be glad that you noticed. And we aren't trying to count up to the highest number possible. That's not what we're doing here. It's almost like in walking meditation where for those of you who've done that and you're going back and forth just in a, in a row that's 10 feet long or something, we're using it to introduce a little bit more um, rigor and discipline. Um, and that is what the counting is supporting is a little bit more rigor and discipline. Now, if you try the counting and you don't like it, that's fine. You can just drop it. It's only here as an option in case it's helpful. And a lot of people do find it very helpful. I do it when I'm doing it intensively, like on retreat, I will always use the counting at the beginning for the first several days. So you can go ahead if you feel like trying it again, if you don't want to, that's fine. So um, I will be giving instructions, you know, periodically, but there will also be longer periods where you can just notice the serenity. And this is another thing you can do is to notice the serenity at the pause. So if you find your mind's wandering in the pause between the out breath and the next in breath, another option is to notice the serenity. Or if there are any times when you just can't be in touch with the breath, you can't notice it, or it's hard to notice, you can notice the serenity at that point. So I'll go ahead and start the sitting and periodically I'll give instructions, but I won't be talking the entire time. So I'll go ahead and ring the bell and then I'll also ring the bell at the end. So finding your comfortable meditation posture, sitting as upright as possible, but also being relaxed, really planting your feet firmly on the ground if you're in a chair, if you're sitting on a Zafu or bench, really noticing that your knees are touching the floor and you're supported. Surrendering our weight into what we're sitting on, feeling supported by Mother Earth, relaxing and really surrendering our body weight as we settle in.
And now noticing the breath in this area of the Anapana spot or region, or if that's not what you'd like to notice, then you can notice it at the belly or wherever it's predominant. But if it feels comfortable in this area of the Anapana spot or region, that is a support for our mind stream really coming together and becoming a little bit more unified. So then noticing the breath here, feeling the soothing quality of the breath. not needing to do anything else other than just notice the breath. Noticing the inhale and the exhale. And if you feel that you'd like to use the counting, having the in-breath and the out-breath, and then just gently placing the number at the pause, if it just did like one, going up from one to eight, and then back down from eight to one. And if at any time you notice you're lost in thought or you're, you've gone to a higher number, with kindness, with gentleness, without self-criticism, just come back to the breath. And if you're using counting, start at one again. Feeling yourself really settling in to the serenity. And you can also notice the serenity at the pause. But this is a time for you to be present to yourself, to your direct experience, and to the simplicity of the breath. And I will be silent now for some time, and then I will come back on and off throughout the sitting.
Noticing where your attention is now. And if it's wandered off the, back, off the breath, bring it back gently and with kindness and really committing to do your best to stay with the breath in this present moment. And if it feels right to you, to try using the counting as a support for staying as present as possible. And if the counting starts to feel like it's too much, you can always drop the counting if you like.
Notice where your attention is now. And if it's longer, bring it back with gentleness, with kindness. And be happy for the times when you are with the breath for many moments or minutes without substantially going off of the breath, knowing that you're cultivating this capacity to stay with something without being distracted, getting lost in thought, ruminating. And as the practice deepens, feeling the serenity of being present, not having to do anything, just being right in this present moment and cultivating a mind stream that can be increasingly powerful, even laser-like over time. Settling in, really appreciating the peacefulness, the non-doing, and whatever's present for you.
And in these last few minutes of the sitting, really bringing all of your commitment, sincerity, intention to staying in this present moment with your breath, not with a sense of striving or over-efforting, but with a real sense of commitment of cultivating the ability to be in the present moment without wavering, without getting distracted or lost in thought and mind wandering. Really doing your very best to And as we come to the end of the sitting, feeling into your own goodness, your own willingness to work with your consciousness, to exercise it just the way we exercise the body, contributing to the increasing level of consciousness on the planet that is so needed in this time.